One of the most mysterious objects in the solar system is Jupiter's moon Europa, thought to harbor a subsurface ocean of liquid water and possibly even the conditions for life. The more we learn about Europa, the more interesting it gets. My guest today has detected water vapor in the very tenuous thin atmosphere of Europa that may be related to the ocean that may lurk below. Welcome to Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Dr. Lucas Paganini. Dr. Paganini is a planetary scientist with a focus on icy moons, comets, and planets. He holds the position of Research Associate Professor in the Department of Physics at American University and has been working with NASA as a group member of space and ground-based missions with key responsibilities including management duties, development of data analysis techniques, and hardware design for astronomical observations. Welcome everyone to Event Horizon with me, John Michael Godier. If you enjoy what you hear, fall into the Event Horizon, hit the like button, and become an active subscriber by ringing the bell. Lucas Paganini, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Now, Lucas, you study the very tenuous atmosphere of Europa. That's right. And... Jupiter's moon Europa. And Europa is obviously one of the more interesting objects in the solar system um, with the possibilities of maybe liquid water underneath an ice shell. But you study the atmosphere itself and you found something very interesting, water vapor. Tell us about what you found. Well, so we can say that this project started back in 2015 and we've been doing analysis of planetary atmospheres, we've been analyzing the composition of comets, all thanks to high-resolution infrared spectroscopy, which basically allows us to study different excitation processes of molecules in these atmospheres of planets and, and comets. So back in 2013 or so, we we're able to detect some molecular activity, outgassing activity in a comet called 29P, which was beyond 6IU. So in 2015, we said we knew that um, there were these recent discoveries of plume-like hydrogen and oxygen by Hubble. And we said, you know, we have the tools, we have the expertise to detect or to at least search for molecules such as water vapor, but also ethane, methanol, and so on in, in objects far away in the outer solar system. So what we came up with is this idea of searching for water vapor and other molecules in Europa's atmosphere. So after, after a, a review process, we were awarded um, a total of 20 nights with the Keck Observatory using this infrared spectroscopy at high resolution. So of those 20 nights, three were lost due to weather and the other 17 nights were successful. So we searched for mostly water vapor in Europa's atmosphere. 16 of those dates led to upper limits meaning that we did not detect water vapor, but at least we were able to set certain boundaries, um, at least like, a, like a, a level in which we would not detect water vapor. And on one of those dates, we were able to measure water vapor. Now, is that because the water vapor is transient or was there some sort of threshold that you might, it might have been there, but you weren't able, just simply able to detect it? What does that imply? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. So 
Um, when we gathered this data at the end of the entire campaign, we needed to assess what you know what what is what are these data telling us? And 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 the first question is if we have only one measurement out of the of a total of 17 what is that implying what is that telling us and and to our understanding this there could be two options the first one is as you mentioned there's a, a level of activity that we're not able to detect say if because say that our so, so our instruments in general have a sensitivity limit and remember that we're at about six uh, five AU from from this target Europa one AU means the distance from the Sun to the earth and we're using these super powerful telescopes but still you know we're far far away so that limitation uh, or that limit is as you said set a threshold of the amount of water vapor we're able to detect. The fact that we were close to the sensitivity limit means that there might be a certain level below that sensitivity limit we, uh, that we're not able to to observe. Now, based on theoretical studies, we know that water vapor should be there, uh, should be present. Water should be present in the atmosphere due to the radiation by Jupiter. There's been different models suggesting a large number of different possibilities and uh, from detectable levels from the ground to non-detectable levels from the ground. If we would have detected water vapor on more occasions, then we would have asked ourselves, is the water vapor we're detecting in the atmosphere related to blooms or is related to these so-called exogenic effects? Um, which are basically the, the, the particles stripped from Europa's surface. Now, since we detected or we measure water vapor once, the number one hypothesis is that this might be due to some sort of like strong, kind of strong source like it would be produced by a, a plume um, on Europa. So it hints essentially at the plume. Now, did you detect anything else other than water vapor? For example, one one might wonder about uh, some signature of salts, maybe, or something like that. Did you detect anything else? With this technique, we're not able to to measure salts. I understand that there are other techniques using Hubble that might be able to to detect this this kind of particles um, in the surface. But we basically, we can, we would just obtain upper limits for methanol and ethane. Now, what about those? Um, did you did you find methane? Uh, ethanol and, and methanol, sorry, not ethane. Um, so, I see, so alcohols, type, right, that type of yeah, thing. Yeah, so we were able to, to search for methanol and ethane, and those upper limits are just helpful for provide some input to studies by other modelers, but essentially, and also set some upper limits for for upcoming missions that might be searching for those molecules. We just set a boundary. Now, possible future missions might be able to improve those limits, but we, we just set those limits at the moment. How about Europa Clipper? Will that be able to sort of constrain down what you found? So, um, just for clarity, I'm not related to the Europa Clipper mission, so my understanding is, is you know, just from reading what the mission is doing and, and whatever information they, they provide, some of the, the mass spectrometers might be able to set some or provide some analysis of those particles. I'm not entirely sure if they're going to be able to do it, but but I, I suspect that they'll do it and they'll be able to acquire some of that information. Now this is, uh, you, you started looking at comets and comets obviously are, are have a lot of water ice and we know that. 
what did you find there? What was there anything you know surprising about um, your study of comets regarding this technique? And you used infrared. How did that work? I mean, is it is it absorb is the water vapor absorbing sunlight and then re-radiating it? What's the science there? Yeah, so yeah, comets are amazing, and 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 we think that comets have some sort of like role, not only since the origins of our solar system. Uh, but also throughout the development of our, of our solar system, we might think that comets might have been the source of, of um, water in our own oceans. Uh, there might be some prebiotics that that were um, provided by comets to to different planets. We know that Europa might have been hit by by different comets as well. So. They have differently a significant role in in the development of of our solar system and and the processes that that we see today. Um, we've been successful at using infrared spectroscopy in comets, and that serves as a sort of like proof of concept. Um, we detect water vapor on a regular basis as well as other molecules in comets. The technique is is you know well ex- well established um, so yes essentially what we look for in the infrared is for the excitation that the solar radiation produces on these molecules so basically solar photons interact with these molecules they get excited and eventually there is uh, what is called the radiation decay and what we try to measure is what is called a uh, fluorescence effect. So uh, that fluorescence is essentially a mid slide in the um, infrared and that's what we are able to detect with these powerful telescopes such as Keck. So this might yield information on the early solar system and the delivery of water to in our planets, right? That's correct. So if we're able to detect, say, things like the ratio of deuterated water to water, we can assess the relation of water in comets to that in Earth oceans, or eventually if we're able to detect that D to H ratio in blooms of um, Europa, we might be also able to infer where that water came from. That's interesting, tracing the origins of water effectively, which obviously is, is something that <laughs> something that life on Earth very much needs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And tracing the history of And this of is the interesting thing too. about, right, and that's the interesting, interesting thing about if blooms are present, during uh, some sort of flyby and we're able to to gather information of the interior of Europa, then we might be able to extract more information that's not available on the surface. So it could yield clues about what's going on beneath the ice shell. Right. It's like, or at least the ice shell itself, right? Correct. It's like, you know, finding a tunnel into the inner parts of, of of Europa. So it would be, you know, it would be great if, if, if whenever we have a flyby mission and we're able to fly by any of those plumes, we can gather such information. We, we can really infer a lot of information and gather data from, from, from the inside of of Europa, so that would be amazing. Now, I have to ask a question here, because if, you know, Europa is not unique, I mean, all sorts of bodies like Pluto and Enceladus particularly, seem to be in a similar situation that they might have liquid water beneath the surface. Can you look at those objects, say Enceladus, which has plumes as well, um, and look for water vapor there? Do, is that on your, your agenda to look at the, the other objects in the solar system? Yeah, and, and that's that's a great question, and and I come across always this this question, you know, um, yeah, we detect, we have detected water vapor on Celadus on a regular basis, but it's you know we have to be re- 
we have to be really careful in how we compare these observations. Remember that in order to detect those levels of water activity on Enceladus, we needed a spacecraft. Why I'm saying that is because from Earth, with this technique, we would not be able to detect those amounts of water on Enceladus. It's just because of two things. The first one is far away, farther than Europa, and the levels of activity are a tenth of what we are able to detect from, from the Earth. So, and that correlates to what's going on on Europa. Say if you have the level of activity that Enceladus has, we would not be able to detect it from the ground. So it's, you know, we have this limitation and this is why we eventually need to get closer. It's, it's a technical limitation that does not allow us to, to see closer and to see more with more sensitivity and accuracy. Now, this brings up the James Webb Space Telescope. Is that going to expand your capability to look for this? So we expect that Webb is going well, so Webb is definitely going to have more sensitivity and it's going to go into enhance uh, what we can do from the ground. Obviously, it's not going to be affected by the Earth atmosphere as it is the case for ground-based observations. But it, all, it also has its limitations that we were working on towards understanding how the so we basically have the ability to observe in the infrared it's just that the resolution of the web instrument compared to those from say Keck is lower so the effects and the physics we're going to be observing are going to be different so regardless of that web is supposed to be at least 10 times more sensitive to Keck. So we definitely are going to be able to uh, get more data and, and more information on, on these different processes. Now, obviously, the, the fact that we're going to observe with web it also doesn't mean that we might be able to detect water vapor. Remember that this might be sporadic events, and, and by the time it's, it, we observe Europa with web, you know, time is expensive. We need to go through competition, and we have a lot of beautiful things we can observe in our universe. So, say if we get the time. So we have there's a warranty time observations um, of Europa. So we're sure we're gonna gather data on Europa. But just bear in mind that activity might not be present at the time we point web. Uh, towards Europa. So that's something always to, to take into consideration. Now, what about the other Galilean moons? Because there's also hypothesized, you know, possibilities of, of well, there's certainly water ice, but possibilities of oceans at, at bodies like Ganymede. Can you look for it there? We could look for water vapor and, on Ganymede. That's, um, that's definitely a possibility. It's at relatively similar distances than Europa, because they're in the same system, the Jovian system, it is, it is possible. Um, it all is, so we know what our limits are in terms of the amount of water we can detect. In order for us to detect it, then we, we might need an event or an amount high enough for our instruments to detect it. Now, could you, if say you did, say you look, you were able to look and you know, you're looking at Callisto or Ganymede and you don't see water vapor, mm -hmm. would that would that strongly suggest that Europa is particularly special in that this this water vapor must be related to the, the ocean underneath and it must be at a certain depth as opposed to, for example, Callisto where it could be much deeper inside the body and may not be, there may be less interaction of the ocean with, you know, space. Would that reveal... I mean, would those work as a kind of control? Would you be able to say, well, this is happening here, but this is, Europe is different. Would you be able to glean anything from that? That's that's a good question. Um, so even though these, these different moons are in the same system, they seem to be entirely different. You know, Io is an, is an entire, entirely 
volcanic world, at least in Ganymede, have are heavily cratered. They seem to have like thicker ice layers. So, so um, even though they they seem to have an ocean, they might be deep in size. So, say that we apply the same technique and the same strategy we use for Europe, and we do the same thing from Callisto. I expect that, again, we're going to, since our project would be related to detecting water vapor, then we would be able to, again, place upper limits, if not detections. And if there is a measurement, then would be, we would then be try to assess whether those measurements of water vapor would be related to exogenic effects due to the radiation by Jupiter, or if it's some sort of endogenic effect of, of any kind of like liquid pockets in the icy crust or or any kind of like plumbing under the surface that might be triggering those plumes. You know, that's different hypotheses that we might be able to evaluate if we pursue such a project. So exploring the possibilities because obviously Jupiter is the radiation torus around Jupiter is unbelievable, and this might be a mechanism for perhaps uh, sublimating uh, water from the, the surface of, of these moons as opposed to something being related to the ocean below if it's there. Right. So you are you could eliminate that Jupiter is actually causing this water vapor production. Yeah, it would, be, it would depend on the data. Um, I say that you have some sort of like flyby mission and 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 you fly by any of these objects and say you detect water water in the atmosphere then you would need to assess whether that's water stripped from the surface or if that water has been released by some sort of like plume like event um, if you detect water constantly then it is highly likely that it's just, you know, the, the particles strip from the surface and that's what you're gathering in your instruments. Now, if you have one or two or three events after several orbits, then you will start thinking, okay, this is probably related to some sort of like event that, that takes place not regularly. Um, Another option would be if, if you have changes in, in, in the radiation by Jupiter and then that increases the amount of particles released and then you, you again go above that threshold, then you would have to take into account all, all those things. But I suspect that the, the, the flyby missions are going to have magnetometers that are going to be able to assess um, such events. So we'll be able to characterize the radiation environment essentially right. and if it correlates with the production of water vapor then you know that it's coming from the surface but if it doesn't and it seems to correlate perhaps with images of a plume then this is water vapor from <laughs> from the ocean um, as opposed to the surface right that that's exactly right now um with with the 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 detection of water vapor this is this is just one of a this is the newest of a whole lot of indicators that Europa is an ice shell moon and that there is an ocean below um, what are the other what, what's, what's the implications of the other chemicals you saw like the methanol I think you mentioned what does that tell us about the composition of, of that possible ocean well since since we just at upper limits, there's not much we can say at the moment. We just, you know, we set a, a limit and then it's up to new techniques to improve that. Um, again, that helps constrain models of what we would expect. So we expect to have also ethane and methanol and HCN and other particles but again, these these observations are sensitive enough to provide those upper limits. Now, when it comes to the fact that this is the newest of, of another way of characterizing Europa's atmosphere, I must say that this is 
the first time that we're searching for water vapor directly because we truly can see the interaction, if present, we can really see the interaction of water molecules with the solar radiation. Um, in the past, we've seen indirect ways, mostly related to plumes, but not really to uh, the characterization of water per se. For instance, um, to me, the closest to to what we've done, and uh, this is another <clears throat> spectroscopic studies is the one done in the UV, in the ultraviolet wavelengths with Hubble back in 2012, where they were trying to characterize hydrogen and oxygen. And and we expect, you know, when when there was this, this measurement of, of from like hydrogen and oxygen, and since they were obtain at the same time, we thought like, okay, so H2O water dissociates or photo dissociates into hydrogen and oxygen, but also we're supposed to have detected OH. So that being said, our technique provides a direct measurement of, of water vapor. And I think that's the, the, the core strength of our search is that we were able to to, to search for water vapor directly and not any byproducts or or any other indirect ways of, of trying to to detect water so um, I thought this you know in my mind this is the, 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 the so far one of the best way to infer or search for the presence of water vapor in the atmosphere of Europe now in short um you seem to have, since you're working at Keck, which is a big telescope in Hawaii, um, yes. you're looking through the Earth's atmosphere, which has a lot of water vapor. How do you differentiate that you're not detecting something in the atmosphere? How? What's the mechanism there? Yeah, and this is amazing. It's, it's uh, obviously um, years of, of people working on ways to and techniques to overcome that, that issue. With models, we're able to really so we're measuring at the same time the composition of the water vapor composition in, in the Earth atmosphere and we're able to detect the different molecules in different celestial objects. Now, the trick here is first being able to characterize the atmosphere, our own atmospheres correctly so that we can subtract the different components in our own atmosphere and the other key important thing is to have an instrument with high resolution high spectral resolution that allows us to identify the signature of say in this case water vapor in our own atmosphere compared to the signatures of water vapor in other objects such as comets and Europa now, another trick thing, another important thing is that the object we are observing has a certain velocity compared to the Earth, and that's called the geocentric velocity or Doppler velocity. So that allows us to sort of like measure the different signatures at different frequencies. And that's the way we can identify one signature from the Earth uh, to that of, of, of Europa. Now, my last question for you is a little bit out there. We're detecting, and it's been in the news lately, with these interstellar objects, and we have things like Borisov that seems to not be from the star system that's coming in on a hyperbolic trajectory. Can you look at that with this technique and say... There's water vapor there. I mean, it wouldn't really be surprising that water vapor be everywhere in the universe, but have you thought about looking at those types of objects, These this new idea of interstellar uh, interlopers in the solar system? Absolutely, and, and as of you know, now, people are using these techniques both in the infrared and ultraviolet to detect the composition of, of Borisov, which 
Now this is, the sec as you mentioned, the second interstellar object is the first comet, an interstellar comet. Um, so, yeah, we, we're able to detect the composition. What is of now is closer to the Earth compared to Europa. So things are, you know, the sensitivities we have with our own instruments are good enough to both measure or search for the different components. And if not measure, we can provide upper limits. So yes, yeah, so, as, as of now, people and astronomers all over the world have been observing Borisov, trying to identify different molecules and, and, and most importantly, trying to compare what the measurements are to the composition of comets we have in our own solar system and see what's, what the differences are and, and whether these objects from other planetary systems might, might be similar to the comets we observe in our own solar system. That's going to be fascinating to watch unfold because so far, so far, Borisov looks a lot like a, a solar system comet. So, yeah. I mean, that might suggest that, you know, the <laughs> the galaxy is much the same, <laughs> or at least wherever the origin of, of this was, was very similar to our own solar system. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, we never stop learning and and the fact that we just, you know, we've been able to identify this kind of objects since very recently and we're able to identify their chemical composition and how that translates into our understanding of of the universe is fascinating and and that also applies to our understanding of the Galilean moons or the moons of Saturn and as you mentioned before Pluto we're really at you know the the verge of, of finding new things in our solar system which are extremely exciting I hope that you know in our lifetime we're able to to analyze these objects and and to understand them in depth I'm sure there are there are a lot of new discoveries just waiting for us um, I hope that that they're revealed soon in a way exciting times indeed well thank you doctor for joining us today it's been a pleasure and, and anytime I'm looking forward to our next interaction absolutely if you next time I see a paper and you discover more water vapor we'll give you a call absolutely Europa has long been one of the most intriguing objects in the solar system and with the Europa Clipper mission which is set to launch in 2025 we will confirm whether that ocean exists and learn something of its composition and characteristics and the mission will also help to determine a possible location for a Europa lander mission. Europa, here we come. John, why is the government outside? What? It's not tax time yet. They're looking at the car. It's the meteorite, John. Hey, you. Open up, you turkey. You again? What do you want? Why are you towing the car? Yeah, yeah it's that meteorite. It's giving off M waves. Blue rays, and it's got the thing with jigger going out scale. It needs to be properly disposed of. Do I get the car back? Yeah, for a fee. It's right here in this here invoice. Forty grand? And what's this charge for three hundred and fifty dollars for something called TC? Turkey charge. That car'll be back in a week, turkey. And so will I. Anna, get him. <coughs> Joining us next week will be David Grinspoon for an astrobiology discussion. See you then. Yeah, you are!